Good morning. Thank you for that reading. If you haven't noticed, I'm not John. And yes, Lance and Wesley, it's one of those days that proves that God has a sense of humor. This all started yesterday at 11.30 in the morning, afternoon, when Bill Crossman calls and says, John's sick, Marvin's sick, I'm not sure where Marion is, can you teach class, do communion, and preach? So you're stuck with me. That's partly true. This was an opportunity that uh, I wanted to take and uh, for a little time. The scripture that was reading, that was read, has to do with a little something we're going to be doing here. But before I start, uh, one of the things we're doing, of course, as you know, is we're looking for a new pulpit preacher. And before I get into this message, um, we have a selection group uh, committee. And if I may, Marvin, if you would stand, and Marion, if you would stand in here, and then Rick's back there, I believe, in the back. He's on the committee. And Mark, if you would stand, please. And myself, and Del Weisenbach, and of course, Bill Crossman. The elders, we are making up this committee for the minister search. So I want to just kind of announce that and, and bring that to your attention that we are the ones, if you have any comments, of course bring them to us. The elders are going to be leading up this committee as we go through. And as a count yesterday that I received, if I remember right, we have like 10 people who have submitted uh, resumes on this process. So it's moved along much faster than I think we believe, kind of thing. Do we have another number, is that right? We are. We're going to do that later in here. So just to kind of give you a heads up, and just for a, a little comment that my wife made to me, you know, are there any women on this committee? My wife, Virginia, you get the idea. <laughs> if you would turn with me to Second Peter. And of course we know when we speak about preachers, Peter was, of course, the first preacher that we saw with the gospel stood up on that day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and preached such a wonderful sermon that 3,000 souls were saved. And that's what we look for. In the time that I've been here at this uh, body in Leavenworth, which is 1973, September time frame, um, we've gone through quite a few ministers, if you will. And I'm just going to go down through some names very quickly here, just so for some of us that remember these. The gentleman who preached to me the first gospel message that I ever heard was by the name of Joe Teal. Um, he baptized me, and he actually married Bonnie and I also, so it was one of those things. A uh, gentleman by the name of Joe, uh, David George, uh, Steve Wimp, Eddie Lee, Jim DeBose, Marty Kessler, and of course John Telgren. That's the line that we have seen over the years, been through this pulpit, preaching the gospel here in Leavenworth. And of course, along with that is our elders. We always have those who teach with us and keep the gospel straight. Bill Crossman, uh, you know, in here, our current elders, Marion and I, we've served together years, Marvin, Francisco, and so on. And of course, Bill Crossman and Joe George were in the prison ministry and preached for years through the ministry around the United States and here especially. One of the gentlemen that I got to see in this pulpit a few times was named by Carl Bryant. Those of us that remember Carl, his amazing mind, he had the entire message memorized. And I mean Genesis 1 through chapter 22 of uh, Revelation, and he could quote it. And it was amazing in here. And, you know, and other people that I remember in that message, Sam Bernard and Vester Aiken, they were the elders that were here when I first came in. But all these people preached the gospel. They gave it to us in a way that we understood it. And so many of us were converted and became Christians through that word, through their mouth. In this word that we have this morning in Second Peter, in verse 19 and 20, Peter writes to the church here, We have also had this prophetic word made more sure, which you do not do well to heed, 
as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is ever given in private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but by holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. In this process of looking for a preacher, this is the type of man we're looking for. Someone who is moved by the Holy Spirit to preach this word. Somebody who can get up here day after day, be in this office, be at this building, be at our beck and call to make sure that this word is that light shining to us. And that's what we want to look for. As these words are preached, we have to remember that these are mere men. They are moved by their emotions, if you will, by what the Spirit gives to us. They don't have the word like Peter and Paul and John did, but they look at the word and they take that word and they give it to us in a way that we can learn and study. And in these things, we have to remember that we have to kind of decide what type of minister do we want here in this pulpit, sitting beside us in this pew. So we have many things as a congregation to look at and make sure that the elders understand this is what we want to do with this church. Because not every church does the same work. In Leavenworth, for example, the prison ministry has been such a big thing for us. But in other places, it's something else. But we have to deal with what we have here and the work that we can do. So it's very important for us to do these things. Just kind of turn over a page over here in chapter 3 and verse 9 in Second Peter, if you will. In this verse, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, that should come to repentance. Because the man who stands in his pulpit is doing that each day. is trying to make sure that God's will is confirmed, that we understand that nobody is to not receive that repentance, not receive the gospel. And that's his job. We want his mindset to be always to push the gospel forward. And it's very important that we choose that type of man. These ten names that I mentioned that we received in here, they all have some type of education. They have some type of experience. They're married. They have children. And we look at those things as being some of those qualifications. Many of you don't know who I am. My name is Tommy Herkin. I'm a Christian. I was baptized in this place. I will probably die here. But the key thing is, I know a lot of people here. And that's all the qualifications that I need. But the men we bring into this pulpit, we don't, need, we don't know who they are. But the neat thing about these qualifications we saw in these resumes is, so many other Christians put their name next to their name, stating that these men are good workers and they will push the gospel forward and that's the type of thing we have to look at it's very important Romans chapter 10 if you will as the gospel was preached Paul wrote many many things an abundance of things that we use and in chapter 10 starting in verse 14, 15, if you will. How then shall they say on him in whom he has not believed? And how should they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how should they hear without a preacher? And how should they preach unless they are sent? These are the things which we look for. We need a man who will take the pulpit. He will take that word and not be afraid to go and preach. We've been lucky these last few years because I've got to know John over the last decade, if you will. And of all the preachers that I have named here that I listed that I've known, I think John is probably the one man who has gone out and probably gathered as many people as he can to preach the gospel personally to, not just from the pulpit, not just in the classroom, but actually gone out and gathered somebody by their hand and said, let's talk about the gospel. And this is the type of man I think we should try to continue when we look at these people. They should have that type of desire because it is very important because there are those who are out there who have not heard the gospel 
and we need to make sure it gets out into the world. It's very important. That's why Paul puts these things in verse 17. Then faith comes by hearing, and hearing the word of God, and that's what the preachers will do for us. It is our duty to do those things ourselves. But the preacher, he's here. He's one us to look at. And we want to see him doing that work, and he reflects the congregation. So it's very important for us to do these things. Colossians chapter 1, if you will. In verse 23, If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. These type of words that we see written here, he wrote this to the church at Colossae. He wanted to let them know that he became a minister for that purpose. The men that we have approach us who put their resume forward to this purpose. This is something they feel a calling to themselves. They have decided that they want to go forth, they want to work with the church, and they want to preach the gospel. They chose these things for them and their families because as we know, we've all been in churches and the pulpit minister and the ministers who work there, the people who work side beside them, are their wives. And we cannot forget that. My strength in this life comes greatly from my wife. The things that I'm able to do, the things she encourages me to do, is very important. Family. And we have to look at those things. Because Paul, as we know, gave up that family life. But in the same thing, we find that he had other people that he made family. Turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 2. In this letter we see written, he calls Timothy his son. Paul didn't have a wife. He didn't carry a family around with him like Peter did, John. The other apostles, they were allowed to do so. But he did have people like Timothy and Titus, Silas, Apollos. These are the people that he carried with him. Luke. When there were no other people with Paul, he said, Luke is only with me. So he had people that were with him almost all the time as he went through this life. In chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at the appearing of his kingdom preach the word be ready in season and out of season convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but according to their own desires become as they are itching ears they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and turned aside to fables. But you, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. These are the words that Paul gave to his son, to Timothy, and they echo, echo to us to this day of what our responsibilities are, responsibilities are to the gospel. And this is what we want our minister to do, to preach the word, in season and out of season to preach the truth to not sugarcut it sometimes we've heard preachers do that sometimes sometimes we need to have spoken to us the truth as it is and we have to accept it as the will of God but we want, uh, we want a man who will stand up here speak to us with compassion and kindness and understanding who will work with us and give us advice and give us correction and reproof as we need. And we work with them to do these things because as we see in our world, as this word, scripture reads, they will pull to themselves teachers that do not do these things. That's our job as a congregation, to choose the right man to fit into this pulpit. We have to, to choose for our children, 
and the gospel in this community to make sure that what we do here is according to the word as it needs to be. Go back to Luke chapter 13 for a moment, the reading we had previously. In that parable that was read for us, a certain man in a fig tree planted in a vineyard, and he came and found it with nothing. But what it comes down to is in verse 8 and 9. The groundskeeper. But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it, go, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, very well. The job of our minister is to water and feed and dig around our roots to make sure that we grow and that we produce fruit. And this is what this parable says. And we have to understand that. Sometimes my roots aren't so easily dug around. Sometimes my feet are planted pretty firm. But I have to have an open mind to listen and accept the water and the word. Because Paul and Silas, all they did was plant the word and Lord, the Lord gave the increase. And this is what our minister is going to do for us. We have to look at them. And as the word says, we have to judge the spirit and understand where they are and make sure we make sure we have the right choice. In all things in our life, we have to make the right choice. This day, we have the choice to walk out that door and not accept Christ, not accept the gospel. We have the choice to step up here into the water and receive the baptism, the remission of sins, and the gospel, and the life in Jesus Christ. If you have those desires, we would offer that this time we have a song of invitation we would like to sing. We'd like to invite anyone who has a need to come forward, because that's what we're here for. And as we do these things, we will stand and sing, praise God, and allow ourselves that our voices raise, that he hears it, and he allows us to make the right choice for this pulpit and for this church. And we thank God for that choice that we have. Thank you. <laughs>